So Kurt, it's really great to have you here uh, to join us for Instagram Live. Um, yeah, thanks if you can just tell people uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, Hardcore Gaming 101 so people can kind of get an introduction. Okay, uh, so Hardcore Gaming 101 has been around since like 2004 or so. Um, it started off as covering either just like obscure stuff or just whatever I was uh, interested in at the time or just like uh, examining individual entries in long running series. Like for right now, as you can see, the front page covers a lot of stuff about the worm schemes. Mm. Uh, so we're running a gigantic feature about those. Wow. Um, and then around in 2011, we started putting on books in different subjects. So we started that out on a gigantic, like phone book size, things on point and click adventure games. Uh, and then we since moved to the shorter, smaller digest focusing on either certain genres or uh, certain game developers like Sega and Konami are big. We're big fans of them here. <laughs> Uh, it's it's amazing, Kurt, because I will say, if you ask anyone to kind of look up some of their most obscure games they could possibly think of, one of the first sites that comes up in Google is hardcoregaming101.net. So it's pretty cool uh, to have you here to like kind of just discuss everything in terms of like the website and all the games that you've been playing and just the research that you guys do down there. And I guess really the the question I have for you is how do you like actually come up with all this information it, it's you think about like the history of video games and all the information that you're trying to get it's it's bewildering and so <laughs> what's like the research process typically like when you want to like discuss a game and you know do a review on it uh it depends like i, I do a lot of uh especially japanese stuff so i spend a lot of time browsing japanese wikis yep and that's kind of a good starting point uh for pretty much anything and then you just still go down the regular like wiki wormhole of like, okay, this game is related to this game. This game was worked on this specific guy. And then you look up and see the history of what he worked on. And you, um, like a lot of what I do is try to find links between certain things because every genre has a like a history behind it and everything is inspired by things that came before it. But not all of that is known to a lot of uh, like the American or European audience just because we didn't always get those games. Uh, so I try to like place where the origins of these things are or, are the links between they are so hmm. and then like what is i guess the criteria for games that you typically decide hey let's you know pick out this game for example as we look <laughs> at like teenage mutant ninja turtles uh the manhattan oh. project on <laughs> nes which oh that's about part of the podcast for the site podcast people actually request them <laughs> mm. uh and and so we end up discussing for about half hour 40 minutes and then we we rank them across like so far, we've ranked out 500, 600 or so games, and we, we look at them and see, like, well, among all games, which is this kind of fit compared to this one? And we end up with this, like, weird sort of Frankenstein list. Um, but it's just, <laughs> it's interesting to see how, how many users run for and uh, see what ended up in the top, which end up in the middle, what end up on the bottom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as far as games, it just, like, like, one I wrote about recently was a game called Time Lord, which you see on there. And it was just a bad game I remember from my childhood. <laughs> There's a lot, of that, a lot of that sort of stuff. Are there any games that, when you look back on it, that were, like, really good as, like, you know, when they first came out, then you look at them now and, like, wow, this is, like, really bad. And then as well as, like, the vice versa games that were, you know, I guess, really bad back then. And you look at them now and they're, like, eh, it's actually not that bad. There are games that I they, I think we didn't really understand them when we they first came out. Um, like the roguelike genre is something that if you if you look at the games the the reviews and I remember playing them back then, like nobody understood what they were. Like just for some context, they're this sort of like randomly generated dungeon crawler games that have their roots in like eighty software sort of things. And um, back in the late nineties, we had this uh, Konami game called Azure Dreams which it was just, they, they stuck in so many different types of gameplay things. Like you explore this randomly generated monster, but it's also a dating sim because there's all these girls that are after you. And it's also a town building sim because that was just something you do. And it's a monster easing sim. And at that point, like I had never played anything like it. But of course these games had sort of existed in Japan for a while. Uh, so, but going back and revisiting that game and, and placing it in a different context, like, oh, okay, this is, this is actually pretty cool. I enjoyed it a lot more. Hmm. It's funny uh, you mentioned that, like, as a kid, I used to love the game ALF, 
for the sake of master system. <laughs> oh, the sake of master system. Oh, man. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's crazy that, like, I look back on it now and I read everyone's reviews and people just say it's, like, a terrible game. And in my mind, I'm like, no, this game was amazing. This game is great. Uh, so has there ever been a game, or I guess in your opinion, what's been a game that's, like, aged perfectly? Oh, my God. And I Buy know that, Commando? That, that's so many, but I, off the yeah, top of your head, like... That that Bionic Commando for the Nintendo is is still my like ultimate favorite. Like I can't believe that game is as good as it as it is. Uh, is there ever? I guess here's like a really cool thing about hardcore gaming one on one dynamic. I like to call it like a deep rabbit hole because normally I'll just like look at like the homepage. I'll check out one side, and the next thing you know, I'm like on page forty five. <laughs> at that point, of just like clicking at like obscure, obscure, obscure games. What was the most difficult? obscure game that you've had to research oh my god there, there's so many of them like i have i literally have a pile of games like on top of my computer that i can I'm we funny. see the, can we see the, the location of where you're at because i think this is kind of like a, like amazing of <laughs> like all the games that you've got behind you it's like yeah. incredible uh so, i mean it's just trying to sound my, my phone this is well uh, <laughs> and sega hat that i got when i was like in second grade uh and is that all games all behind you, like on the on the shelves that we're seeing? Oh, oh yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> the how Fatal Fury hat. Would, how many <laughs> games would you say are, I guess, like in the collection that you have, like right now? If you, if oh, you I had have to no like idea. pull up a number. <laughs> Probably thousands. <laughs> wow. <It's, laughs> wow. Some of them are buried somewhere just because I can't fit everything quite in. The, well, that's just my window. It's not that exciting. But. Wow. And you're you're based here in New York, right? You're like a local local guy, right? Uh, New Jersey, suburban New Jersey. So uh, just curious, like, has there, you know, really with gaming, it's really, we rarely ever, you know, think about, like, our, you know, our beginnings or where we're from. Has that kind of, like, influenced how you've, you know, collected games, how you looked at games, like, your perspective just on retro games in general? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, a lot of it was, like... I started branching out more when I was in high school and that was when the internet started coming out. Mm -hmm. And then um, you learn about like, yeah, I grew up reading Electronic Gaming Monthly and all those sort of magazines and reading about all those Japanese games that we would probably never get. Um, so that's how I started dipping my finger into that. But suburban New Jersey is also kind of isolated. Like I had never seen like a Japanese game at all. So wow. when they first came in the mail, I was like, oh my God, this came from halfway across the globe. <laughs> And of course now there's eBay and it's just like, it's no big deal. Like you can even find regular gaming stores that'll have like a super Famicom cartridge or something like that. See, it's, it's weird. It's funny you mention that because even here in New York, which generally you would think has like a wealth of resources to get a lot of import games and just, you know, just a lot of the games that I would say were not really the mainstream. So let's say for example, like the TurboGrafx-16, which was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I would say most of America probably doesn't know much, much of that catalog, right? Whereas like New York, LA, yeah. you know, we're big media markets. Surprisingly, um, New York is actually like a very tough area to actually kind of get retro games when you kind of think about it. Like we, It we, is. And I always just chalk that up to uh, the rent prices. Like it was better 20 years ago when, when Chinatown had all that sort of stuff. Because uh, I used to go there all the time in college. And uh, there was this big underground mall, which I don't even really think had an official name on Elizabeth Street. Yeah. And they had like, in addition to like anime fan subs and just bootleg merch and all sorts of stuff, there were like three or four different games of, or game stores that was just filled with PlayStation stuff and uh, Dreamcast stuff at the time. And the, the prices there were pretty good too. Uh, but now, I mean, a lot of that stuff is closed. One of them moved up to Midtown, but since they're in Midtown, it's, it's all Midtown prices. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably like the oddest thing for us, like here in New York is that uh, prices are really high if you want to be into like retro games. And so, uh, you know, I, I kind of envy when I see people who are in Seattle or uh, like NorCal would are like next to like a lot of like the dumps of uh, yeah. the dumpsters of like developers and like they can just like pretty much like say, hey, look what I found at like a Goodwill or whatnot. And we're not so as lucky surprisingly for being in such a large media market. Um, so do you ever like do a lot of, I guess, uh, let's say it's like an obscure game, you can't get a hold of it physically. Do you ever just resort to emulation at that point? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, like, some of the <laughs> stuff is either too expensive or uh, 
just be difficult to track down because I, I like waiting my my finger or my fingers into Japanese PC games because mm. again there's a lot of interesting history there and some of this stuff is like you will almost never find unless you go to like one of the game stores over there like in Akihabara and even then it's gonna be expensive like there's some stuff that I had to import or uh, buy just from one of my more recent books like I don't know if you could sort of well, there we go what that is it's a game called Tokyo Nampa Street and it was one of the early games by NX. It was one of the first dating sim type games. <laughs> and like, I, I don't have the hardware to play this on, but it was like, I couldn't find a good image of it. Mm. So I just had to like, there's this website so you can order stuff from them. And they aren't cheap because a lot of these stuff is were really expensive, but I picked it up and just got it and scanned it so I could put it in one of my books. Wow. So do you actually, uh, I guess, know Japanese or read kanji? So when you have to deal with a lot with like these import games, or is that something that you kind of just like rely on patches on or just kind of wing it? <laughs> uh, Midway, I kind of know video, ga video game Japanese and that I know enough to like, <laughs> and, and part of it isn't necessarily language, it's just intuition. Like when you play games enough, you, you sort of like know uh, what the commands are and things like that. Um, but I mean, I've studied it. I know enough to play like, like generally RPGs, like enough to read, like, okay, well, I'm supposed to go here, command menus and stuff like that, unless it's anything particularly complicated. Um, but, uh, but Google Translate and a lot of stuff like that really helps out. Oh, that but if I want to like actually sit down and translate something accurately, it's a much more, like I don't know it fluently enough to do it offhand. So even when you're playing a lot of these dating simulators, like how deep are you able to kind of get in a game? Because they, you know, that's pretty text heavy, you know, to be blunt, or, or are you kind of just trying to get like the gist of it from like the opening scenes? Uh, more the gist of it and the mechanics of how it works, because uh, a lot of these simulations are simulations. Like, they're heavily number-based as, as far as, like, it works. So it's more just understanding the logic of how everything goes. Wow. And has there ever been a game where it's just, like, dude, forget it. <laughs> this is, like, just almost, like, too difficult to kind of figure out. Uh, some of these, some of these the RPGs engine. that are that I'm playing are just, they're just inscrutable. Uh -huh. uh, and the thing is that there's no documentation even about them, like even in Japan, because those really help too. Like, yeah, um, you can Google a lot of the stuff in Japanese and you'll find like a website by some guy or, or wikis that'll give you uh, like a guide on how to get through a particular game. And those are invaluable for some of this stuff. Because even back then, like if you speak the language, it's just, it's just hard to understand. And it was the same way with uh, English RPGs. Like they really, um, it was important to uh, have the instruction manual, or you were just expected to figure it out yourself. Wow. <laughs> so uh, one of the first Japanese RPGs we, we traced that back to was called, I think, Chite Tanken, mm. or something like Chite Taiken. It's from 1982, and it's by Koei. And just like, I can't figure it out, and there's no resources to figure it out. Um, yeah, it, 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 it does get a little bit hard to try to be like a primary source of this stuff, and just like, you can't. <laughs> we you sh we should you should definitely post that on twitter and just like basically do a big call out like guys who has information like on this game <laughs> you know there's um there's this is really uh good oh god the japanese video game preservation society that's not their official name um but they run an archive of uh all this sort of stuff over there they collect games they they uh they scan the software and the guy that runs that is a French guy who lives in Japan named Joseph Redon. And he's like invaluable for this sort of stuff, uh, just as far as the reference, because there, there are not very many people that are really into like the Japanese PC scene. So the resources are kind of slim. Yeah. But he, his aid has been invaluable on in some of the stuff I've been doing. Wow. And this is a question that actually just popped up down looking at the question box. What's like a Japanese catalog that you feel is endangered of being like lost to time? or lost to history? Uh, a lot of that PC stuff, which again is, is kind of like uncharted territory. Like even a lot of the games I know offhand, uh, we know because of console ports. Mm. Um, one one company that I think kind of has a cult following is Telenet. And uh, they made games like El Viento and the Valis games. And their games are rarely particularly good, but they, they, were, they were fun. They had a really good visual style. They tend to have really good composers. Um, but they were primarily a PC developer for quite a long time. And there's a bunch of games that they put out that are just like nobody has ever heard of. Mm. But again, there's no, uh, 
like emulators are, are tough to understand. There's not a real like ROM resource to understand where they are. There are preservation sites in Japan. Like there's a, um, a site called Project Egg, which they're sort of like GOG in Japan in that they focus mostly on retro games. So you can subscribe to them. You pay like 600 yen or so, and you can even do it um, from any type of bank account and play one of their games. But even then their, their catalog has a lot of um, missing stuff, stuff which is like, kind of important when tracing the genre history, but um, when they, they, they don't have the rights to get that sort of stuff, well, like, like what do you do? Yeah. And, and a lot of like these Japanese developers that have kind of, uh, you know, so to speak, like have went bankrupt after, you know, let's say like the PlayStation 2 or PlayStation 3 era, uh, has the rights to a lot of those like catalogs, do you feel like they've been secured into like other companies at least that they can somehow, you know, unearth the source code and repurpose them? Or do you feel it's been a little bit, you know? A little dicey? Yeah. It, it's on a case by case basis. Um, some of them do. Like I, I've always had a, like there's this old Sega Mass System game I loved called Galvelius. And I've always wanted a, like a sequel to that game and they never really made one. Uh, that was made by a company called Compile, which again was big in the 80s and 90s Japanese scene. Uh, they also made the Puyo Puyo games. Um, yeah, they, you know, the uh, good Turbo Graphics games, weren't they? Uh, I believe uh, Blazing Lasers might have been. Yeah, they made they made Blazing Lasers. Uh, they made what other what other games? They Spriggan, I think, is on the Turbo Graphics 16 mini. They made that game. They were big into shooters. Uh, but again, they had a really diverse PC library sort of stuff. The rights to their stuff is, they're held with a Japanese company. Mm. So some of them are. Telenet, I know, was a little bit wishy-washy because there was a, oh, I can't remember, Tokyo Twilight Ghost Hunters, I think, was a PC-98 game that got remade for the DS. And uh, But there's some sort of weird rights issues that surrounded those. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of them that are just, like, totally missing. And it doesn't help that... Uh, like you might find a Western company that would be willing to license it, but I don't know whether the audience would be there for something that obscure. So here's a question that actually just popped up on our Twitter. Uh, very interesting, actually. Has Is there any games for systems like the Atari Jaguar or Panasonic 3DOs that are very unique to Japan that you would love to cover? Jaguar, I don't think there's anything like at all. <laughs> Uh, 3DO, there's <laughs> definitely some games out there. There's one RPG that ended up getting ported to um, the Saturn, but I think that came out here. It's called Lucian's Quest. Or it's called Sword of yeah, Sorcery. Yeah, yeah, that came out here in America. I, I yeah, I think it's like the only Japanese RPG uh, that really came out in the 3DO. Because, I mean, that was mostly an American system. Like, it came out there. Um, I know they made police knots for it, but, like... You can play that in the PlayStation and the Saturn. There are, There is one game. I can't remember the name of it. Um, there's this trilogy of games. It started out with an RPG called uh, La Place No Ma, which is sort of a dungeon crawler, except it was based off of like HP Lovecraft sort of thing. So instead of uh, going through a dungeon, you were uh, going through a haunted house. Sounds and cool. it had a really, really unique system because uh, instead of NP, you had mental power. So some... And like you cast like magic spells, it would drain that. But enemies could also drain it. And uh, if it went to low enough, then you would go insane. So it was sort of like a predecessor to Eternal Darkness in that way. Uh, but there were a couple other games in that series, and one of them was 3DO only, and I can't remember the name of it. Wow. It had a strange name. Now, when, uh, it, when it comes to like an obscure, I want to say obscure, but when it comes to like the systems that you know weren't as popular, let's say like the Jaguar or 3DO, does that make it even harder to find those games in Japan? Or you know, what's what is that kind of like situation like if you had to like research? Uh, as, as far as like, like you might not be able to find the ROMs, but the games I've never I found have never been that expensive to find just because like over there it was kind of a flop, and it never built up the cult following that would make it expensive mm. like the only japanese 3do game i have is star control 2 which is a western game but it's like one of my favorite games so i thought it would be a neat novelty mm. um but it was like trivial to buy it wasn't that expensive is, is there um, any, is, playing them is kind of a problem though because there's it's technically no region lock on the 3do but japanese systems did have a rom to display kanji characters so if it's a game that uses them it won't work oh. and i haven't used a 3do emulator in a while wow so if you use a 
So let me get that straight. If you use a Japanese 3DO game that has kanji and you try to put it in an American 3DO system, won't won't work. Yeah, it won't work. Oh wow! Yeah, if it's, I did not know that. Yeah, it's um, it, it's sort of the way that the P, I think some PCs work too. Is that like the the actual like like graphical characters are not within the game; they're sort of within the system, and they would be located on the ROM in there. And of course, like from an American perspective, none of the um, people that put out 3DOs, they would like have a need for it. Uh, but of course they did in Japan. And <laughs> if it tries to display characters, it's not going to find what it needs and it's not going to work. Okay, so here, here's a very interesting question. Have there been any games in Korea that you wanted to cover? That is like outside of <laughs> pretty much anything. Like like one of the guys <laughs> that used to write for my site, uh, he was huge into that because his, his wife is Korean. Yeah, and he lives in Korea now, so he did a gigantic special on all the different game developers there and all the different games. And uh, <laughs> like, that's pretty much the only resource for a lot of the stuff that I know of. Like, I didn't know about like pretty much any of that stuff. Well, are are there like Korean specific, uh, I guess, exclusives like on mainstream consoles? Let's say, for example, like the SNES, or did that ever exist? back then or no there was a korean developed playstation game like one of them that i know of but almost all their stuff is restricted to the pc so yeah. most of their stuff runs on dos or windows oh, interesting and ha has there ever been i guess a japanese system that uh that did not come out here in america that you were just like really enamored by like that's like wow this is like an amazing catalog like a, an amazing hit to flop <laughs> ratio so to speak uh, I mean, I don't know if I would. I mean, I, I've been kind of wanting to dig into the Wonder Swan oh. catalog, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't exactly call that a hit or anything. Not the Pippin. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll skip that. I, I only have so much room. Like that place is a it's a mess anyway. Like, <laughs> I'd probably just sit in the closet. So I, I wouldn't mind the, the SG one thousand would be cool just because it's it was basically the the Japanese ColecoVision. Hmm. Uh, the hardware is like almost identical, and they have some sort of. Like neat stuff, like our early Sega uh, games. I think one of Yuji Naka's first game uh, appeared on there. There's a whole hobbyist thing that'll actually convert SG1000s for a ColecoVision, and then I like, put on cartridges and make up little packaging and things like that. I have a couple of those. Wait, so hold on, let me get that straight. Did you say an S like a Sega SG1000? Yeah, and you can actually it play it on a ColecoVision. Uh, they need to be reprogrammed a little bit, wow, but they're hard. It's so similar that the conversions can be done by hobbyists. Wow, that is crazy. I had no idea. I'm learning a lot of stuff today, Kurt, in terms yeah, of it's, it's a uh, let's see if I I mean it's up on there somewhere. But yeah, there's um a game called Ninja Princess, which was a master system game. It came out here called the Ninja. And it was on the SG one thousand also, and I have a, a port of that to play on American ColecoVisions. Wow. So here's an honest question I got for you, Kurt. As a as a guy who has to review a lot of games, as one that does a lot of research, when does it no longer become fun? Like, <laughs> it, it, it makes sense. Like, is it like work for you? Is it more so like are you able to get to enjoy the games? Um, like, how 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 do you stay vested in video games when a lot of it? You know, let's be honest. A lot of times, there's just a lot of bad games that are just out there. There are a lot of, a lot of bad games. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there are definitely games that I play for fun and games that I have to play just to cover them. Uh, and it, it, it does, it does tend to clog up projects sometimes. Like I need to get something done, but like, a, geez, I don't want to sit down and play this game. I need it. <laughs> um, luckily since like I, for those, I tend to uh, like look for freelancers for like, <laughs> if it's just something like, like I, I try to, not only understand my, my personal feelings toward the game, but also like how the audience likes the game, like how it was received, what people like, what people don't like. Like there's no true objective opinion on a game, but you can sort of get like a broad consensus about how what people feel about it. Uh, and so I try to view a lot of games from that perspective and you be more open-minded than what my own personal tastes are. Mm. And then there, there's some games that like, I, I just can't do it. <laughs> And just find somebody else that actually does like them and, and understand them and can explain them in ways that are that, like I just can't. Wow. Like I guess if you if you about a popular game was Mist was a game that I always like hated even when I was a kid. Um, you know so what? Like, I, I've always like, been fascinated why uh, what made that game such a huge deal in the mid '90s. Um, yeah. it, it's fascinating just knowing how many people like how commercially 
successful that game was. And, you know, especially for people who, you know, that came at a time when PCs just weren't as like, you know, not everyone had a PC. And yeah. It's amazing just to know how big of a deal it was that like when uh, the PlayStation and Saturn and 3DO came out, it was like, must have, must have missed as part yeah. of the launch of the system, you know. It, it just, uh, it, it came at the right place at the right time. It was, uh, you know, the CGI sort of stuff. Um, of course, like critics hated it at the time. <laughs> Like, I remember PC game, they would just, they would just trash it constantly. Because, you know, I was more, like, I, I love point and click games. Uh, hello. 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 <laughs> I say hi, we're talking about old video hi. games. <laughs> <laughs> so is your, are your kids big, is your child a big gamer? Or yeah, do you hope yeah. your daughter will be big into video games? <laughs> What's your favorite game right lately? What do we just beat? Yo-Kai Watch! Yeah, Yo-Kai Watch. Oh, uh, Yo we beat Dragon Quest Builders a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Dragon Quest Builders 2, finally. After like three months. Yeah. Right now, she's just been watching me play Final Fantasy VII. So. Oh, wow. So, it, Kurt, when, you're, when your daughter grows up, will you hope that she'll have as much affinity for a lot of these retro games? Uh, I mean, for her, <laughs> it's gonna, they're going to be like ancient, <laughs> like ancient games. Yeah. Like she's like our age. Oh, wait. <laughs> we back in a little bit, okay? We're finishing up soon. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know. She likes some of them, but uh, some were too hard for her. Um, especially like anything from the 16 bear era. Like she loves Super Mario 3D World. Um, and Yoshi's, uh, Yoshi's Woolly World. But like we play Woolly World together all the time. But Yoshi's Island, I think it's just too difficult for her. Wow. And a lot of newer games are just more accommodating and as far as like difficulty levels, like a lot of those games have lives. So if you run out of lives, you have to start over. The newer games don't really have that. Because um, yes. the concept of saving your game in 16-bit games was something that, um, especially on like platformers, was, wasn't always in a lot of those games. So you were expected to replay stuff if you die. And that's just like part of a genera different generation, basically. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I actually find you know, current gen games actually a lot more complicated than, yeah. you know, when I go back, I, I'd say the era, era for me where it started getting like, okay, there's a lot of mechanics like I don't learn here was probably past like that, uh, the PlayStation 2 GameCube era where it was just like point A to point B. That's literally the objective. It's like smash this, smash that, get to point B in, in some time frame. Now with a lot of the open sandbox worlds, it's it's a little, for me, it's a little bit more complicated. So, do you ever feel there might come a time when I guess there's a certain generation of games where it will be very difficult to look back on in terms of like how we look back on the 32 bit and the 16 bit eras where we can finally look at them as like retro masterpieces? Oh, I mean, I guess as we move farther and farther away from it, but there are still games that sort of keep those sentiments alive in modern context. So I guess the spirit is there mm -hmm. and like, like, she might not be able to like enjoy Mega Man, like the old Mega Mans, but she still likes the newer Mega Mans or, or Shovel Knight or things like that, which are like retro style games, but gets rid of the stuff that, I mean, we, we, they, we just like dealt with it because that's what we had. Mm. And over time, we just sort of grew to like it because that was like, it was normalized. It was what was established, um, whereas they don't necessarily have it in the newer games, like smooth over all that stuff. Um, and I guess as long as there's still people that are keeping that spirit alive, then I, it won't really ever completely die out. Gotcha. Um, but like, if you want to play like a, like, like a retro style JRPG, there's Bravely Default or Octopath Traveler. And going back to play even like an old Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest game, it's not impossible, but it's a little, it's a little rough. Mm. So here's an interesting question that actually just popped up. Uh, do you believe that the Wii U's catalog will ever be respected? Uh, and that's interesting, I, considering that all the ports now that are happening to the Switch, there's there's not many yeah. uh, left in terms of that, you know, dual screen experience games that are still out there. I mean, maybe uh, it, it is sort of like occupying the space of a Dreamcast where it was only really alive for a couple of years. Um, again, most of their stuff was Nintendo uh, Nintendo products, and they've actually been pretty good about porting all their stuff. Um Star Fox Zero is one that I think deserves a second chance. Like I, I, I bounced off it when I first played it. When I went back to try it again with an open mind and, and try to understand how it worked, like I, I, I came to enjoy it, and that could 
maybe be ported. Um, I mean, like Wonderful 101, that was another game that they brought back. I can't think of too many other, like, really Wii U Houston exclusives that they haven't done anything with. There's, like, Xenoblade. Um, or I guess, like, you look at, uh, there was the, the Batman game. I, I think it was, like, Dark Knight, where they actually did some custom stuff with the, the tablet itself. I thought that was very unique. So there is there are some experiences that are still there that are unique to the Wii U even for games yeah. that were like multi-platform, but uh, that's a tough question to be honest with you. Like, you know, we're now three years deep into the Switch's uh, lifespan and it's almost like the Wii U, like, did it, did it exist? Like, I, it's almost <laughs> like. Uh, they, they definitely kind of want to like, yeah, that was uh, something we did. Just we don't talk about it. <laughs> but I mean, people still like respect, like, like 3D World again was a fantastic game. They deserve to keep that alive. Uh, the 3DS is, I think it even, um, an even bigger one because like the, the 3S is an outstanding library, uh, but it's definitely kind of been forgotten in f- favor of the Switch. But a lot of their games, like they do rely on the double screen or have to have the touchscreen mechanics that make them difficult to port. Like the Castlevania games, those are, don't, weren't really 3DS, but they were DS games. And they haven't been ported anywhere because especially the uh, first one, Donna Sara, it relied on the touchscreen. So like, how do you, how do you do that? Uh, unless you like reprogram them to just take it out, which I think having to reprogram a lot of these games is more work than a lot of these developers want to put into versus just like an emulator, which is, isn't nearly as expensive or uh, time consuming to do. Hmm. Have you uh, covered like Wii U games, I guess, on hardcore gaming that, you know, <laughs> I guess that I you feel are deserving of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember anything that, it was, it was really worth I mean, I just keep it up so I can play, like, Super Metroid. Or Metroid, Hi, Fusion Metroid Zero. She's <laughs> 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 excited about getting changed. Uh, <laughs> so here's a, a quick question. I want to turn to some of the recent projects, projects that you've had. Uh, you recently did a book on wrestling video games. Uh, yes. Uh, and I know I, absolutely first question nothing is, about wrestling. <laughs> Well, here's, a, here's an interesting question, though. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Gamers are tend to be, uh, there, there's like a strong affinity toward wrestling and video games. It's like, uh, yeah. I guess, video gamers are fans of wrestling, and then fans of wrestling are fan, big fans of video games. It's just a very unique, you know, I guess, fan circle that just happens yeah. to like align. Uh, I guess, what is the infatuation with wrestling and video games that, the genre it just fits so well you know together the sport just fits so well into the video game culture it's uh it's theatric i mean it's a lot of like violence but it's sanitized violence um that again is my extent to it like i didn't actually get and i don't even though a lot of my friends were into wrestling it wasn't anything i was really into mm. um but one of uh one of the contributors to my site he he put this book together and the amount of uh wrestling knowledge he has is just insane uh <laughs> So that's how uh, he asked me to help, like just get involved with it to uh, like put it together more or less. Uh, and I was interested because there's a lot of uh, developers that were entwined into it. Like Technos was the the company that made Double Dragon, which like established like the beat 'em up genre as we know, which led to Final Fight and all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles beat 'em ups. And they were big into wrestling, so you can see how like that genre game basically grew out of the early wrestling game that they made. And here's, I guess, just a very interesting question. Do you feel, it's actually funny because I know you, you said you're not really like a big wrestling fan, but there was a point in time during the mid nineties before WCW started blowing up and the WWF was a little bit kind of somewhat becoming stale. Uh, mm-hmm. But the hottest property that was out there was uh, WrestleMania. Uh, which was like mm-hmm. a you know a big arcade game. So in a way, wrestling video games were kind of keeping a little bit like that sport, like in pop culture relevancy, so to speak. Uh, so wrestling actually had you know quite a bit to thank, uh, had quite a bit of gratitude that it needs to show for you know what video games did for it as as a medium and as a somewhat uh, sort of support for keeping them alive. Uh, has there been any video game in the wrestling genre that you feel like really transcended, uh, I guess, both uh, cultures, so to speak? Uh, 
as far as like, oh god, Saturday Night Slam Masters ah. uh, was a, a game that I can I can gel with because it's sort of like it's more of a fighting game. It's a Capcom fighting game just with like in a wrestling context. Uh, so that's a game that I can like easily easily play. Ah, interesting. And then just in terms of like some of the other recent books that you've done, you did something, uh, a recent book about Japanese developers um, or I guess Japanese games, I guess uh, of nature, like I guess top of your mind, what's like really like the best Japanese developer that everyone should really get to know in terms of like a catalog? I mean, I've always loved Konami <laughs> and uh, like I, I, everybody knows, <laughs> everybody, everybody knows Konami for the most part. Um, now, which, but Konami, there, which, which Konami are we talking? Are we talking 80s Konami? Are we talking 90s Konami? 80s Seattle and 90s Konami? Konami. After that is a little bit more... Uh, <laughs> um, but again, they had a lot of games that never came out here. Uh, and I think that they're becoming more catalog. There's a lot of really neat Famicom and MSX games that they did. Um, yeah, a lot of good RPGs. There's one they did called Lagrange Point. It's a sci-fi RPG. Uh, they were really big into sound hardware, too which because of the hardware differences between the NES and the Famicom, we never got any of the, the additional like sound chips that they were able to do. So if you like video game music, they were really cool to revisit. I mean, as, as, again, like a company like Telenet, again, never really put out a good game. Or, well, a, maybe a good game or two, but they put out interesting stuff mm. every once and again. Um. Those are the ones that at least pop off the top of my head. Data East, again, they put out, they're probably known more for stuff like Bad Dudes. Uh, they had that really like 80s sort of zeitgeist feel to them. Uh, but they did put out some later games like Boogie Wings was a really neat uh, shoot 'em up. A really cool treasure style game called Ed Randy. Uh, I don't, a lot of those, like they, they, they put out a lot of Data East systems and compilations, but those games tend to be lost from them, I guess, because the rights went in different directions. Um, one game that did pop up that you can get on the Switch is called Night Slashers, though, which oh, comes highly recommended. Amazing arcade game. Was that was that Data East or was that... That was Data I, East, yeah. Wow, I didn't know. See, here's, here's a crazy thing. Data East, I guess, amongst like the hardcore enthusiasts, we all know that developer, but I think in the mainstream of, you know, casual gamers, they'll primarily only know Capcom or Konami. So it's really great that you guys you know, bring up a lot of these developers whose catalogs could honestly, you know, get lost to time. Um, so, Kurt, what are some other future, I guess, projects that you hope to be working on or some other books that you intend to be writing? Okay. So, right now, for the past year or so, I've been working on a gigantic book about Japanese RPGs <laughs> oh. <laughs> to the point where it's, it's pretty much consumed my life. Like, every night, I'm just digging through something. I have a gigantic spreadsheet of, of of stuff so that's my work list and like I, at a certain point i have to start cutting stuff just to meet a deadline um but this is kind of like what my floor looks like oh you can sort of see all the stuff i have lying down here wow <laughs> so are you <laughs> are you tr i guess what's like the edit you know for those of you for those of the people watching who are aspiring video game journalists and writers what's kind of like that whole edit process how do you determine what to cut out essentially in terms of like uh, in a book <laughs> it, it's it's hard uh especially because like this is a project i'm doing for bitmap books mm. um and, and as a publisher they have more resources than i would normally have like as for me like since i do mostly self-published things there's a limit as far as pages uh so i can't you know there's, there's price and commercial things to consider so i can't make things too big and sort of see to reprioritize based, based off of like what is the most important what's the most what's the best uh, I don't quite have that age limit, but I do have a deadline. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I just, I like, I, I write down something that looks interesting and then I eventually get around to playing it. And I'm like, this game is, there, there's a lot of like stuff that basically isn't really worth anybody's time. So it's not really worth like documenting when there's better stuff to put in. Which of course is like, again, when you're on a deadline, you're like, oh, I wasted all that time writing this stuff, which is probably not worth much of anything. And here's a question that actually just came in. Do you have to worry about rights when it comes to video game images? Not really. I mean, everything, at least as far as uh, American law, is under something called fair use, mm -hmm. which means that uh, you can use images from the stuff if it's to supplement, like, historical or critical writing, which I, I guess when you have a book, there is kind of a fine line of, well, are you writing, is it 
about the writing or is it about the art or is it about something that is like potentially copyrightable? Like strategy guides are definitely kind of a dicey thing if they're not officially licensed. But if you're putting out a history book, then it's not really a problem. Mm. And uh, what you, but it is something if you do to kind of have to skate around though, is that we can't come off like we're an official product. So we definitely have to say, okay, this is an unofficial guide to the whatever, whatever. Because another thing that is uh, we're working on later down the line is a book about the Shin Megami Tensei and Persona games. Wow. And there's no real other guidebooks that have been put out about those games outside of like strategy guides. But at the same time, we need to make it clear we're not Sega, we're not Atlas. If you buy this, you're not getting something from them. Uh, which again, if you know our stuff, you would understand what it is. But somebody who doesn't uh, might not that it's it's not an art book it's not a comic book it's it's not fan fiction which is something i have to explain a lot at conventions um well yeah as, as long as we make that clear like legally there's no problem uh, about this sort of stuff wow and we actually have a lot of questions in regards to just writing about video games uh one that came in was how do you verify your sources uh well when it comes to japanese stuff again we re we sourcing stuff off of wikis which we can't really use as a main source. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes, I use that more for understanding game mechanics or story issues. Like, um, but when you're getting into like what so and so worked on, then you kind of need to dig a little bit deeper about the sources that they've laid out. Uh, especially in a place that scanned Japanese magazines of the era is is hugely important. Um, and that's really about the best that we can do. Like something that I've, I've actually been trying to verify lately is uh, Landstalker. I don't know if you're familiar with that game. Uh, Dreamcast? Uh, uh, Sega. It, it was, uh, it, they're connected. They're made by, uh, well, there's a Dreamcast game called Time Stalkers. Time, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah. And they're sort of related to the Shining Force games. Like, they, they are, they're made by, like, people that are related, but they're not quite the same company. And there's sort of a rumor out there that the game was originally called Shining Rogue. Mm. And I'm trying to verify that. And it doesn't, like, there's one Japanese site that says that's the case, but it's just, like, some site. It's not, like, uh, or, or an actual, like, big site. Uh, on the other hand, there is another Sega game called Crusader Ascenti. And that game was originally called Shining Rogue. And we can verify that because somebody scanned an image from a video game magazine that explicitly <laughs> said this game was called Shining Rogue. Now it's called, called Ragnacenti in Japan. Uh, so it's something that I'd like to get more sources of. Um, First of all, that whole you process that you just described, Kurt, just sound, sounded wild. Like you had to yeah. go find a video game magazine in Japan, but find I mean, like I, that, that had it, you know. Somebody has to, to do that work. And there's a lot of great resources that do this sort of work. Like uh, the GDRI, the Game Developers Research Institute, is great about this sort of stuff. The Twitter is like a hellscape, basically, but as far as social media, it's it's invaluable for finding a lot of these people. Like the guy, one of the guys who made Landstalker, he's on Twitter. Like you could just, wow. if you have a question, you could ask him. Wow. And have, have you ever resorted to social media as a means to essentially get answers at this point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. I, I, that's, that's how I found people to interview. Like um, I was really into the Wonder Boy games for a while. And I just I looked at the credits and, and found the guy who directed the game. His name is uh, Ryuchi Nishizawa. I just put him into Google, found out he had a Facebook account, and just sent him a request, and we got to chatting. Wow. So that's how we started you know, doing some interviews and stuff like that. And that's how you just, like, meet people around the Japanese gaming sphere because they're, they're kind of tight-knit, especially people that are around the 80s and 90s. And, you know, they know people who know people who could, like, introduce you these sort of things. And some of these guys are even uh, still making games now. Um there's this one guy, he's been porting some old Japanese PC games to Steam. Uh, so there's one game on there called The Demon Crystal, which you could get. I think it's even on the Switch now. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, 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 he had done a, like, the old game Mappy. If you remember that Namco game, he did a, a port of it using like basically ASCII characters, or whatever the, uh, the equivalent of ASCII characters were in Japan. It's just like the weirdest thing. <laughs> but I, I was so impressed by it. And then I found out he was on Twitter. Like, dude, I have to congratulate him. Wow. But I mean, some of the people that like my, made my favorite games when I was a kid, you could like contact them. Wow. Right? When I found that they, they follow me on Twitter, I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> that's a pretty cool feeling. It, to, me, to be honest with you, it's actually kind of 
uh, you know, really amazing to think that a lot of these big developers from the 80s and 90s that they're actually on social media, you know, now it's it's actually kind of a, it almost seems like it's so not long ago, but they were so distant from us and unreachable that a lot of these game yeah. developers, that's, it's, it's unfanable to think that we, we can actually find ways to contact them. Like now we forget yeah, that they're human, you know. It was a, it was a kid. So Japan was like you know a magic country, which which could have been on another planet for all I knew, because I mean you you couldn't like get in touch with them or anything. And now it's like you just go on the computer and then like yeah, type something up in Google Translate or see if they they know English. Well, uh, Kurt, we're actually going to be running on time here, but real quick, what are some games that we can expect to be seeing soon on Hard Gaming, Hardcore Gaming One Hundred and One? Oh God! I need to look at the schedule. Um, one thing that we, a project we wanted to do was uh, a big book on beat 'em ups, mm. which uh, all that got delayed a little bit as I was focusing on the RPG book and getting the Shin Megami Tensei stuff together. Um, so there's definitely one on a couple of games. Undercover Cops was kind of a neat beat 'em up that should be coming up soon. There's a gigantic article on Bubble Bobble that's going to be coming up pretty soon. Oh, uh -huh. a lot of people will love to hear that because that's people's childhoods. That's how a lot of dates started. <laughs> it's, playing it's, it's a good two-player game, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. I can't remember anything else. I need to look at my planning thing to see what we, exactly else we have scheduled. Wow. So it, it's amazing, like, how many games that the possibilities of, you know, what you can review and what you can cover. The Japanese RPG book is actually quite interesting for us to all check out. Are you having to play, like, each, you know, like, I mean, come on, this is like each game could be like a 50 hour <laughs> journey. Oh, I can't play them. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, like the thing is, like, these aren't full size reviews. Like, it's more like an introduction to a lot of these games in, in a lot of ways because, like, we just it can't play, especially some of these old or just like not particularly good ones. But a lot of it is also built up on, I mean, I've been playing these games since the original Dragon Warrior. So, since I've been like nine or 10 years old. And I've been playing a lot of them through the years. So, so like, I still, like, know my feelings about the game, even if I hadn't played it in a long time. So I revisit them and so I'd be like, well, maybe I like this better than I did now. But, again, the reviews aren't necessarily that long because there's so much stuff to cover. Like, even now, it's ranking in to be about 500 pages where each each game maybe gets about a page, which is about 500 words, um, just because there isn't, quite this the amount of time or space to do to do something really expansive but i think the breadth of the the stuff that we'll be covering here is going to be really really cool wow we really look forward to it and i think for everyone that's watching this video uh and everyone that's going to be watching it later you guys definitely need to check out hardcoregaming101.net like i said it's it's like a rabbit hole of video games no matter what era of video games you like uh you're gonna find it on the site both obscure and some of your fan favorites. And one of the stuff that I, I always love thinking is that even if I have the game and I played it a thousand times, I always love hearing what other people have said about it. Do you ever find that yeah. like, you know, like- uh, Oh, I do that. Well, I mean, like, again, my, my feelings and thoughts about games do kind of change a little bit over the years. So sometimes I'll, I'll go back in an old article I wrote like 10 years ago. I'm like, what the hell is this guy thinking? <laughs> so sometimes the way it's like my own personal diary and, and you know, Things like that change over the years. <laughs> wow. Well, what's one game, I guess that we can just leave this off here. What's one game that you would want people to just play that you feel has never gotten the love that it deserved? Oh, gosh. There are games that I love, which are hard to recommend because they're almost objectively bad. Uh, I guess going on that, that game in specific is called East 3. Mm. And it's a side-scrolling RPG called Falcom. And it's not very good, but they did do a remake of it, uh, which you can get on the PSP, on the Vita, on Steam, called East Oath and Felgana. And that is like one of my favorite action RPGs. The music is fantastic. Just the action is it just is really, I don't know, I guess crispy is the word. <laughs> um, well, we definitely got to check that one out. We'll put that in the, in the description below. Uh, Kurt, I do want to thank you again for joining us on Instagram Live. Uh, you've been a great guest of LI Retro. We look forward to always having you in the future. Uh, always amazing uh, advice in terms of what games we need to play. Again, uh, check it out, guys. It's hardcoregaming101.net. Make sure to also like follow them on social media. It's hardcoregaming 
uh, 101, I'm trying to figure out what your Instagram handle is. Yeah, Harker Game underscore 101. Underscore 101, as well as on Twitter, HG uh, underscore 101. At uh, HG 101. If I'm at H E underscore 101, because again, some other guy had that <laughs> like a decade ago. And as well, you can also find them on Facebook at Hardcore Gaming 101. Uh, Kurt, so great to have you here. We hope to have you again in the future. You're literally just like a library of knowledge when it comes to like some of the best video games out there. Not even the best video games, just video games just <laughs> in general. Like even, you know, the ones that are so bad that we just want to like know about. Just, yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, one of the main things I want to do is it's not necessarily like we know what the great games are. It's the interesting games. It's that's interesting. what we want to. And you know. and that's why we love like hardcore gaming one hundred and one. And again, it's just such a wealth of knowledge. Um, Kurt, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, and yeah, we look forward to you know hearing more from you and seeing uh, uh, what's you know come upcoming next on hardcore gaming one hundred and one. So. Oh yeah, thanks for having me tonight. All right, have a great night, and thanks again everyone for watching.